pricing can be a very, very powerful marketing strategy if you play it right. And it's a really good way to get exposure because I didn't have a following back then. I, I was really a nobody. But that was the sort of thing that I used to get people's attention. And it worked. Hello and welcome to Confessions of a B2B Entrepreneur. And today we have a massive episode. We have Brett from Divine Joy coming on the show. So if you don't know about Divine Joy, it's essentially a one-person design agency that has between 20 and 30 clients charging between eight and $5,000 a month for doing maybe in the range of $1.5 million a year with very high margins, obviously, because there's no team members and brave basically creaming cash for this business. And then has also developed a course, which is doing maybe forty, fifty thousand dollars a month, that explains how to build on these productized services businesses. So super exciting, super interesting. This episode was actually recorded in the Twitter space. So the audio may not be at the level that you have heard before. There are also are a couple of times in the episode where I get other people on stage to ask questions. Super interestingly, Hunter Hammond comes on to ask Brett about a legal dispute, although I think there was a joke. And then we have some other people jumping on. So slightly different format of the episode, but still awesome. Some really big insights, especially about Brett's strategy of not necessarily being an entrepreneur or building a business system, being a very well-paid freelancer. And I'm sure he won't mind me saying that. But then he's taking out that cash and then investing that for cash flow. Super interesting. So we'll jump into that in a second. First, we've got to give a big shout out to Fame.so. It's actually my company. We start and grow podcasts like this. If you are a B2B company and want to have a podcast like this, go to Fame.so, request a proposal and say that I sent you. Let's jump into the episode now with Brett. Hey, really, thanks so much for joining. Brett is just going to be coming on in a second. And then we're going to be running through a whole host of questions. I have a lot of questions to ask Brett about business, about design and about investing. So Brett, when you can... I am here. I was just going to share this out real quick, but we can progress. Amazing. Brett, my first question for you, and I don't need to do an intro, I don't think, because I think most people here are probably already aware of who you are and what you are doing. My first question to you is, what do you like more? Is it designing or is it business stuff? Because you seem to be pretty good at both. Yeah, I mean, Design Joy might lead you to believe I'm decent at business. I don't think I don't give myself that much credit. I've always said that I'm really a designer at heart. I just sort of fell into this whole business thing kind of by accident. And I still, to this day, don't quite know what I'm doing. So I would 100% say a designer with aspirations to, to be a better entrepreneur, but designer at the end of the day. And then the other thing, I mean, studying you this week, the other thing I found out is that you're also pretty good at social, right? Because... You had this Tumblr blog in the past. You also, I believe, worked for a company that flipped social profiles. And it seems like social is a big or one of the reasons why Divine Joy has been successful. So would you say that's another one of your skills? Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't know that part of my history. So yeah, I mean, this was a long time ago when the social kind of sphere looked a lot different. Yeah, that's where I got my start was building really large social media platform pages within the platforms. And then I took about a 10-year break and came back on Twitter a couple of years ago. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess I've always had sort of a knack for social media, sort of having understanding of, I guess, what will resonate at a viral level versus what will not. I just, I, I guess I've always had a good gauge of that. So yeah, without a doubt, it's contributed to sort of the boom of design subscriptions and design joy without a question. I mean, granted, I did a lot before social this time around. I had only gotten on social two years ago. I'd run Design Joy for almost seven years. But certainly the boom that I experienced a couple of years back was 100% due to, I guess, my social strategy, you could call it. And so we're combining this, like, I think you might not want me to say expertise, but we have like definite competence in like entrepreneurship and building a compelling offer, obviously the design skills, and then this ability to grow a social channel. Seems like if anybody had like your ability at those three things, then it wouldn't be a surprise for the the result that I think you've produced. Is there anything else that we're missing? Is there any other hidden skill set that's enabled you to do this? Yeah, I think that's one of the missing pieces, especially I think in the design world, I think it's becoming a more of a topic. But we're so focused, at least in my industry, on, on just becoming a better designer. I think we rarely talk about how marketing plays into your ability to sort of earn more money, get better jobs, that sort of thing. 
and just get more exposure, which is always good. I think that's the missing piece in a lot of really entrepreneurs in general, whether you're a developer or marketer or whatever. I think marketing yourself is generally where people, I think, tend to fall short. Now, I've done it my own way, which some may or may not agree with, but you really can't dispute the fact that it's sort of worked for me. But yeah, that I get asked, like, why don't you share more work? Why don't you do this and that? It's not my strategy. It's not how I got to this point. I've got to this point in a very specific way. And so, yeah, I think I mean, it's not good enough to just be a good designer. It's not good enough to just launch a cool new business model. You have to understand how to get distribution and how to actually talk about it and get exposure to it. And so I think that's where I've sort of locked in and focused on more than anything. For sure. So I want to touch on a couple of points in all of those three things. So entrepreneur, social skills, and then also design. And then I want to get into more of the cash side and what you're doing with all the profit that's generated from the productized service. So let's do design first. How do you think you got so good at design? Because I think one of the reasons why design joy is working well for you is you are so it's, it seems good, I'm not a design expert, but also fast in producing the work. If it just yeah. practice. Yeah, I, it's funny. I sort of contribute it to like what I would call mild obsessive disorder that I have. And really anything that I get in, involved in, whether it's business or personal life, I usually become very obsessive over it. This started way back in 2010 when I launched the Tumblr blog and I generate over 100 different graphics a day in Photoshop. And so even before I was a designer, quote unquote, I was really... It was out of necessity. Naturally, the more content you put out, the more exposure you got. So I just went hog wild with it. Did that for several years and ended up with almost 100,000 different graphics at the end of the day. And these were like, they're synonymous with the internet now, but these sort of like silly little inspirational like graphics on imposed on top of photography. And now that's transformed into memes. And I was one of the early ones to do that. And so I just cranked out a bunch of them. And so that followed by job after job after job, sort of put me in a similar position where I think efficiency was favored over quality or process. And by product of not going to school, I didn't really quite learn those processes, which I think is a benefit to me. I just freaking just cranked out the work as fast as I possibly could, obsessed myself over design and aesthetics and being in sort of the know of what other brands are doing and what constitutes really good design, just being constantly surrounded by it allowed me to sort of just go on autopilot at this point in time and just crank it out really fast. So yeah, it's just a little bit different of a of a journey than most go through. Most are not in the position that I was when I got started and the positions that I found myself after that. But yeah, it's just one of those... It's a contention within design, but it's worked well for me. Let's switch to the entrepreneur stuff. Mm -hmm. And I heard you talking on another podcast about a concept called time to value, which I think you think is very important in like the well, freelance or productized service world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time to value. I forget where I heard it from. I didn't make it up. But I heard about it after I'd already sort of put it in the spotlight when it comes to design joy, which is funny. But yeah, so time to value is essentially reducing the amount of time it takes for someone to pay you and then receive the desired output that they want. And so by example, when it comes to design joy, right? Like if you compare engaging with me at DesignJoy versus engaging with an agency or freelancer, the path to pay is long, generally. With DesignJoy, it's literally 30 seconds. The path to onboard is typically long. Sometimes it's weeks. Especially with agencies, it can be a couple of months. With DesignJoy, it's instant. So there's no onboarding. And so I've just gotten rid of all the sort of roadblocks and I guess speed bumps, you could call them, along the way just to get people in as quickly as I possibly can and then get the desired value that they want. And so I think that's a metric that most agencies fail at. I mean, for sure, if you look at general timelines, I think it's sort of like the freelance model of the future, being able to just instantly engage with a designer, no call necessary, no meeting necessary. I don't have to book a time on your calendar, that sort of thing. It's going to be like instant access to top creatives. And not only that, but to get those creatives then there quickly after. And so yeah, that's Pretty much the nutshell of success of Design Joy is reducing time to value. Sounds like something pretty much all freelancers, and it's something I definitely know that we can improve on as well. If anybody else listening has any questions, by the way, just ping them to me on Twitter or also raise your hand. I'm happy to just jump in. Next up is roughly how many clients do you have at the moment, Brett? It's usually any more, hovers around 20 to 25. Cool. And I know, especially with onboarding, we have a bit of automation, e.g. that goes through Stripe, comes straight into Trello, 
maybe there's a Slack channel. Is there, A, could you just clarify that process because I'm not sure if that's right. But then B, is there any other automation you're using to help you manage those 20 to 25 uh, effectively? Yeah, I think this is a surprising point that I think a lot of people would assume that I have a bunch of like automations to make this thing just work smoothly. There is actually, I can't think of a single automation that I use, to be honest with you. And that's not really a sexy answer. <laughs> but there's been automations I've used in the past, and they honestly just made the process even harder. And so everything right today is completely 100% manual. But even so when I buy, yeah, are you manually mm-hmm. creating that Trello board? Yeah. So what I do is I have in Trello, I have what's called a demo board, which is a blank board. When you sign up via Stripe, I basically go into Trello, dupl- copy the demo board, invite you over to it, and then it's done. So it, it takes me about 30 seconds to do that. And so there's probably a way to automate it, honestly. But <laughs> it's not really quite necessary at this point in time. Here is me thinking there's all this automation behind the scenes. Yeah. Well, the, what I think is a good question. What would have to happen for you to hire somebody to help you with any part of the business? I think in order to maintain the quality of work that I produce, no doubt would have to increase prices quite a bit. I mean, you can look at other productized design services out there that produce similar quality work of Design Joy, and they're usually 2 to 3x more expensive. I know the design quality is subjective, but that's what you're looking at. So in order to bring designers in and do that, prices would have to for sure rise. I would probably have to get serious about marketing and lead generation. I kind of just let things flow as they do right now because there's no risk in that. But when I bring on employees and and that sort of thing, obviously, I got to be responsible in that nature. But for sure, we'd have to work on pricing. And there's possibly a world out there where I try that out outside of Design Joy possibly. But yeah, that's the main primary piece I would have to update. You'd also have to develop and introduce another type of risk into the business, right? The, the management risk. Like, I, I'm sure you'd be a great manager, but then it's also a risk. Devonish, you were just requesting to speak. I'm happy to accept if you want to request again and you can ask a question. Next up, your pricing strategy over the years I found absolutely fascinating, primarily because it's over 10x, I think, over maybe seven years. Can you just tell that story and explain the theory behind it? Yeah, back when I launched this, so I was the, actually the first person to create a subscription model around web design, which is the primary thing that I do at Design Joy. I didn't really have anybody to look at and say, okay, they're charging this and that they're, it's working. So I, it was a total shot in the dark. I knew that to get people to try it out was I needed to do something a little extra, reduce the risk. And so I launched at 450 bucks a month. Which is it just insanely low. I wouldn't even really recommend people who come out with the services nowadays launch quite that low. It could probably be 3x and be still super, super cheap. But that's what I did because I didn't know any better. And yeah, like incrementally over time, I've just introduced what I call demand based pricing, where as soon as demand hit a certain point and threshold, I would read up the price usually about $500 at a time. And I did that over the course of about five years before I landed at where I am today and have sort of stayed stagnant there. But yeah, we've started at five thousand or four five hundred. Now I'm at five thousand eight five eight thousand dollar plan, and it could potentially go beyond that too. But I have reasons for not. Yeah, it got people's attention right away. I think pricing can be a very very powerful marketing strategy if you play it right, and it's a really good way to get exposure. Because I didn't have a following back then; I, I was really a nobody. But that was the sort of thing that I used to get people's attention, and it worked. Yeah, the pricing strategy is absolutely fascinating. I love the logical steps, the ladder you've been taking. Do you see that potentially increasing again in the future? Not quite. I mean, possibly if I decide to scale at some point, for sure. But not at the moment. I don't really have any plans for that. It's a very comfortable rate for me. I I make plenty of money doing it. And and I can sleep well at night. So (laughs) no, I'm good. Yeah, it makes total sense. And we're going to get to that, the cash we're making later in the spaces. Now I want to flip to the social stuff. So Mm -hmm. we have this kind of deep experience growing both the Tumblr and other social profiles. Can we just like transfer ourselves to a parallel universe? If you didn't have all that that social knowledge, do you think that you would have been able to grow and scale Divine Joy in the speed that you have since you joined Twitter, which I think was like 2020, 2021, right? Yeah, I think it was 20, it was about two years ago or something like that. I don't know. I mean, I look back and I don't think I did anything extraordinary back then. I mean, it was for those that don't know, it was someone on Twitter 
uh, and really, really early user of Twitter who has a good size following, shared Design Joy's story before I was really on Twitter. And actually, a client who signed up sent it to me. I immediately got on Twitter and sort of began talking about it. And people began following. So it just sort of out of nowhere, just a random day of the week, all kind of exploded. And I don't like, I don't know. I don't think I did anything super extraordinary, but I think sometimes what's obvious to us isn't necessarily obvious to others. But yeah, no, I don't think it would have exploded quite like it did. I mean, I think revenue doubled within just like a week of that happening. So it went from like 80 to 160K in monthly revenue. So I don't think that would have happened otherwise. Yeah, nice. Got a question here from Das Filter. So I want to quickly jump over to that. What are your thoughts on copy and design subscriptions combined? Oh, yeah. Holy grail. <laughs> um, yeah, literally the holy grail. It's the thing that as the owner, sort of a design joy, it's the thing that I get probably asked the most. And it always kills me inside to tell clients that I don't handle the copy piece. They just go to copy and design go together just so, so perfectly. It's a challenging, it would be a challenging model to run. I think copywriting in general is a more challenging model to run because it's a little bit more high touch than design. There's people like I've helped, mm-hmm. helped Alex Lieber, who founded Morning Brew, launch his. He's doing fantastic. Now he's just copy. And so he's sort of proving that model works in that regard, making all kinds of money doing that. But to combine the two and be really good at both would just be a grand slam. It's like the holy grail, I think, of the productized movement at the moment. I don't think anybody's doing it either, as far as I'm aware. There we go, guys. That's the opportunity if you can manage to, I guess, it seems like it's taken you or like you specifically are able to deliver the design one really well. And you basically need someone who's able to deliver the copy one really well, unless you can get that in the same person, which I guess you may be positioned to because I've seen your writing. Anyway, let's move on. I want to ask about, or staying with the Twitter theme, apart from Twitter and obviously, or presumably referrals, do you have any other sources for customers? Not really that quite compare. I have a side product called Scribbles, which does consistently really, really well every single month. It's just a design asset that I sell that backlinks design joy. But in terms of referrals, it accounts for, I guess, a considerable amount, but not quite near anything like Twitter. YouTube has been just freaking massive for me. And I just fell into that by accident as well, getting invited on some podcasts and some like Starter Story, for example, Starter Story blew up on YouTube. And I was one of the first videos that they had that has almost a million views now. So something like that replicated a couple of times just does wonders through your business. And so that continues to pour in just tons of leads every single day. And Twitter does too. But yeah, it's Twitter and YouTube are primarily what I do now. And on the YouTube side, have you sort of researched this? Obviously, do you have your own channel? Because I've only seen those in yeah. the or like No. No, I don't have my own channel. It's just occasionally someone will invite me on. And the great thing about YouTube is once a video sort of goes viral, it just continues day after day. I mean, I think it's been about a year or something like that since that one released in particular regarding Starter Story. And it's just the life cycle of those videos are are massive and really long lasting. And so, no, I don't have my own YouTube channel. Not really into that side of content creation. I don't know that circle at all. And so that's why I stay at 144 characters here on Twitter. (laughs) Yeah, stay within the confidence, right? Twitter's also okay for like uh, showing the visual work, like the tweet you did yesterday. The text was simply another 30 minute brand done and approved. And the GIF is beautiful 316,000 impressions. Makes total sense. Do you have a Twitter content creation process? I do not. So here's the thing about Twitter I wake up. (laughs) <laughs> and try my best to come up with. Like, here's the thing. Design Joy is a dead, simple, like brain dead business model. At least to me, there's not a ton of depth. It's not like layers of onions that you're peeling back and revealing all of these intricate sissies of it. And that that's something that I can sort of play off of. It's really quite hard to generate content around it. And so there are several days where I don't tweet at all. And it literally costs me a couple thousand dollars a day that I don't tweet based on course sales and Design Joy sort of signups. And so there's just some days where it's just that hard, where I have to go really hard. Now, I, a lot of times when they say good content never dies, a lot of times it's peeling back a couple years ago, looking back and see what I posted that resonated well and how could I modernize that and take it up today to make it relevant. I do that a lot. I tend to stick to only things that are sort of like, quote unquote, this is relative, but like viral worthy content. I don't share a bunch of stuff that I know isn't going to get your reach. That's why my impressions, if you look at them, always remain really high despite not having as many followers as other accounts do and receiving far less impressions. 
And so sometimes that's provocative content. Sometimes it's sharing my work. Sometimes it's sort of peeling back what I can about design joy and how the process works. But no, I don't really have that much of a strategy. I don't plan things out. I don't schedule tweets out. So I wake up, try to come up with a tweet. If I don't, then I move on to the next day and hopefully come up with something. I love that. We have Hunter Hammond on the stage. Also a legend. Hey, Hunter. Hunter, feel free to unmute and jump in at any time. Yeah. Hey, guys. I had a quick question about Twitter. And Brett, big fan, uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. About a month ago, we announced a merger of Design Julian Off Menu, and my lawyers haven't heard back. I just want to know what's up with that. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know that this is the time and the place to discuss that, but we're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> Have a great one, guys. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it, Hunter. Thank you for coming on. See you, Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely hilarious. Uh, thanks, guys. Next up, so I think we've covered Twitter. I was going to ask you, when you said that you only post things that you know or think will go viral, I was going to ask you like how you know that, but I assume the answer is intuition from doing it so much. And then you kind of gave the answers, right? It was like something slightly controversial or something showing your work. Actually, is there anything else that we should be thinking about when we're trying to post stuff that we know are going to get impressions? Yeah. My biggest advice on Twitter is like, be ready. How Twitter works, for those that don't understand algorithms, and I'm by no means an expert at algorithms, but I have a pretty good track record of playing to them, I guess you could say. Sometimes it's all about generating one sort of viral tweet. And what people don't realize is how important the next follow-up tweet is. And then if you come back with another viral tweet, and another viral tweet, and it just compounds before you know it, you've got the algorithm by its bootstraps and you can sort of do what you want with to with it. That's why I'm super, super careful about what I post. Sometimes it's not even the stuff that I want to talk about, but it's I know the best way to get exposure and to sort of progress what I believe this model is and how it can benefit other people. And obviously my own interests too, obviously. But yeah, I think that's what a lot of people don't realize is that and how you get that first viral tweet is often the, the toughest part. But you got to be ready. That's what I did when someone mentioned me on Twitter, got on there, created a viral tweet. It went by. Obviously, it got a lot of exposure. and I made sure that the subsequent tweets were backed up too. But yeah, I think a lot of people fall into the trap. And I don't think it's a bad thing of just posting what they want to post on Twitter. I actually prefer to follow accounts like that, to be honest. And that aren't worried, that aren't necessarily worried about getting the most impressions. But at the same time, that's sort of a double edged sword because you can really reduce your exposure that way if that's what your goal is. So it's a careful balance that you have to play. Makes sense. So we're like there and we're waiting to get the first one thread or whatever that's going to get a lot of impressions. And then after that, we have to be super careful or super attentive to try and just keep that going. And if we can, then we're going to keep hitting bangers. That's what I'm basically getting. Yeah, I've never really quite heard anyone even really say that. I, that's been my experience from whether you're talking Tumblr, Facebook, and now Twitter. That's been my experience. I don't know if that's scientific necessarily, but it seems like I've done that several times on Twitter where I go about a week lapse of tweeting and I tweet something viral and then the next post just is exacerbated in terms of exposure. And then next post after that. So it is one of those things where you have to be ready for it. Sure. Now, what I also love about what you've done is you've taken two assets that you have and you've produced another one. So asset number one was obviously your knowledge of setting up the design subscription and getting it to, I think, about 1.5 million a year. Asset number two is the Twitter audience. And so you kind of combine those two and then built, if anyone doesn't know, a course called Productize Yourself is in Brett's bio if you want to go and check it out, which is then produces this extra revenue stream. But you should, like, was that your conscious thought process combining those assets to create another one? At a certain point, it was. It certainly wasn't like a master plan that I had that I thought of years ago. It just sort of come to be a, at a certain point in time where it just made sense. And I got a lot of people at, getting on consultation calls. And I thought, this isn't the way to do this on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And so that was sort of born out of the need to sort of, I guess, increase the reach of the content to the masses. And so that's where that course was sort of born out of. And then obviously, distribution is key with stuff like that. And I had that. And so I know it was only a matter of time. If I just created the content, people would come. So makes sense. So people were paying you like for one on one, like an hour call, etc. And that was just taking up more of your time when you could have been divining, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It was like I did 15, 30 minute hour calls. And they were great one on one. But that was just one person. And now I have the course who have been able to sort of help 1000s of people would have never happened otherwise. For sure. And so we've got the roughly and I'm quoting from the Twitter by Twitter profile. 120k MRR from Divine Joy and then 45k from Productize Yourself at margins, which are going to make me very jealous. 
Mm-hmm. And so what I want to talk about next, the final stage of this interview, and again, if anybody has any questions, tweet me or raise your hand. What are we doing with that cash? Well, there's nothing really to invest back into the business. I don't have a marketing spend or I'm not building any sort of infrastructure or anything like that. So in a normal case where you'd be investing your profits back into the business, there's really nothing to invest it back into at the moment. So a good deal of it goes to taxes, a good deal of it goes to real estate, and a good deal of it goes into my bank account. So I buy some things here and there, but I, Airbnb is a big passion of mine. So we've been fortunate to buy a few Airbnb properties. And that's just sort of a fun thing. It doesn't make near as much as I... I make here at Design Joy, but they're just sort of fun little assets that we can enjoy as a family. We're at one as we speak. And so that's primarily what I do. Yeah, I see a tweet from earlier this week with pictures of this absolute beauty of a house. It looks like a historic house. And so I guess what we're doing here is we're taking these profits, we're then buying assets, and then we're going to be getting extra yield on those assets. Maybe not the same level of the profits from the business, but that's extra cash streams coming in, right? And so that's like presumably just going to compound and compound, and then there's going to be an avalanche of cash coming in every year. That's the point, right? Because I could get hit by a bus tomorrow and Design Joy ceases to really exist. And so as a responsible husband, I want to provide these extra income streams for my family. And this is just the way that we've chosen to do it at this point in time. Obviously, the future of Airbnb, who knows what that's going to look like. But real estate's never been a bad investment, I think, if you ask anyone. And they're fun. It's more fun than looking at digits in your bank account, that's for sure. I think uh, this stuff unlocks something in my mind. So for me, I'm building also a productized service, but almost the opposite of you now, not really involved in the day-to-day. And so the asset is almost separate and the cash that comes out doesn't need me to do the work. And so that's obviously one way of doing it, e.g. becoming an entrepreneur. But the super interesting way that you are now doing, which I'd never even considered, is making the product or service or business really, really profitable because you're in there doing everything. You don't have staff. And then sucking the cash out and using that to buy other assets. And that's something that I didn't even consider. So that's a big unlock for me, Brett. Thank you for that. (laughs) Final, (laughs) Final question. And if anybody else, tweet me or raise your hand. I'll let you in. Final question for me, Brett, is what is next? Oh, man. There... A week, or I guess a couple weeks ago, if you were to ask me what was next, I didn't have an answer. I think there's been a couple opportunities. I unfortunately, I hate to even tease them, but I can't share necessarily on this call with someone that I really admire. And I think hopefully you'll be seeing something soon on that. I really wish I could give more than that, but I can't. But yeah, traditionally, like I've been very content with where I'm at. I I am not one of those guys that really like plans for the future (laughs) at all. I'm like a true creative to heart. I'm like day by day doing the work, closing the laptop and hanging out with the fam. But I think there's been a couple of things that I think I'll be sort of teasing hopefully here in the new future about a future product I service as well as something else. Very excited for this. We've got a couple of hands raised. I'm going to let them in. Cody. And yeah, super excited about this, Brett. And I guess the place where we'll be able to find out or where you're going to tease them is going to be on Twitter, right? Yeah, it's all I have. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Tweet Actually, I've got to this question here. Brett, if you were going to acquire customers today... And let's just say, I'll add this part on, you don't have the Twitter following that you have now. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Yeah, I mean, I would do the exact same thing that I did seven years ago when I didn't have a Twitter following. Really be involved in online communities. What's nice about online communities is they're not algorithmic based. So like with Twitter, you have to know how to work the algorithm to get eyeballs. With a lot of these communities, it's just chronological order. So it's a lot easier when you post updates and announce launches. It's a lot easier to get eyeballs on them and get people and sort of invest in your journey. I'm totally in favor of building in public. It's what got me to this point. That obviously doesn't come without downsides to it. But that's what I would do. I would join communities like Indie Hackers. There's a really good productized services Facebook group out there that has it four or 5,000 members that are building other productized services. A lot of times, productized services are your customers. At least it was mine for the first couple of years. And so that's what I would do. It's not going to be like a rocket ship for it. It's not going to like happen instantly. It's not going to get you there instantly, but it could be a slow growth. But it's a good way to get eyeballs. And to get people sort of again invested in your journey of building this. Yeah, this is what I did. Yeah, it makes sense. Cody and the learner, feel free to ask away. I've got one question for you here. Hey, Brett, why did you decide to not build the productized software? Because something kind of did it. What was the last part of that question? I'll say the word. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. So, yeah, cause you, you sec, U S E Q U E kind of did it. Uh, maybe that's a brand name. Oh, use Q, use Q. I think, that's, <laughs> I think that might be whatever. <laughs> so a couple of things on that point. The idea to build one just came out of nowhere, really. It wasn't as something I thought deeply about. 
I teased, I briefly teased it on Twitter. And I guess not to my surprise, that received a lot of attention and it seemed there was a demand for it. There's a couple of other platforms out there that do it. Brew, use Q. I know Hunter, if he's still in the group, I think he's he might be building one too. And it was kind of two points. I felt like on one hand, the system that I use for Trello on Trello today works for me. And I did not feel it was wise, at least for myself, to involve myself in building software at this point in time. DesignJoy goes through such drastic... I'm in the middle of one now. Such drastic growth spikes that it takes up all of my attention. I didn't feel as though I could do the platform justice splitting my time in that way or do my clients justice in that way. And I felt like, again, my systems that I use work work quite well for me. And so 100% there's demand for it. But that was my personal choice. He uh, makes total sense. All right, Cody and the learner, feel free to ask. Are you, are you guys able to hear me now? Yep. We got you. Okay, perfect. So I have a background in network engineering and network architecture. So like uh, routers, switches, that type of thing. I've been an architect for large Fortune 500 companies. How is that something, like understanding how design joy works, is there something there that you could recommend as far as like a productized service out of that? Is there any way that that could be done? Because I've kind of racked my brain around and I don't know exactly how that would work. Yeah, because you're physically going to these sites. Is that... No, I do 100% remote work. Oh, okay. Okay. It's a lot of meetings, meeting with the key stakeholders and designing out their network and then the implementation of it. So actually implementing the configuration on these routers and switches and things. Yeah. So I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in network engineering and how that works and how that can necessarily be productized. I will say that there are the gauge of which you can productize something usually resides on whether it's high touch or low touch. So like with design, for example, in my world, in terms of like web design, a client can submit me a request. And there's relatively little touch that needs to happen in order for me to execute that request. There are other services like copywriting, for example, that we mentioned earlier, when you're writing maybe technical copy for a product that you re- it requires a little bit more involvement and more engagement between the client and the writer. Those are considered more low touch lines of work, harder to productize because productizing is all about standardizing. And then when certain situations aren't really standardized in size or complexity, it's oftentimes hard to set those expectations and actually meet them. I think everything to a certain extent can be productized. It's productized is really all about selling off the shelf services. And if you can sort of formulate a plan and define what the features are of that plan and define a fixed price to it, that's really the key to productizing it. Now, whether you do it yourself or whether you scale up higher in scale is up to you and that you might be capped with something like what you do versus what I do. Because again, my stuff is relatively high touch or low touch. I think I'm getting those, those mixed up. Long story short, man, I don't know your line of work well enough. But I would venture okay. to guess there is some degree at which it can be productized, but maybe not to the extent that something like graphic design could be. Sure. So when you were talking earlier about your viral tweet, what makes you... Because you tweet so seldomly, you're saying, and you want to make sure that they're viral. How do you know that without getting the reps in? And how do you know yeah. when you're tweeting that it's going to be a viral tweet? Like, how do you quantify that? Yeah, how do you... Or is Great it just question. qualitative? Great question. I mean, a part of it is, is just been doing it for so many years. I guess I have some sort of innate internal gauge of that. I think if I were to be like practical with it and give you a practical answer here, and this number that I'm going to say is going to be different depending on the size of your particular audience. My strategy is if I think that I have something that could potentially go viral, and again, virality is relative. Like virality for me, maybe 100,000 impressions within 24 hours. I set some sort of goalpost. For you, if you had like 1,000, it may be 500 impressions within the 24. It's whatever. It's all relative. And so if when I tweet something out, I'm sort of closely monitoring it for the first hour to two hours. And if it doesn't hit a certain benchmark, which for me is about 10,000 impressions per hour, I delete it. So I delete it right away. I get asked often, (laughs) why did you delete that tweet or whatever? People having conversations on it. That's why. So I'm very protective of that. And I found that those sort of things, even if it falls short, doesn't really affect the algorithm all that much, especially if you delete it right away. And so that's my personal gauge. Again, never heard of really anyone else doing that. So I cannot scientifically back it up. It's just what's worked for me. And that's how I sort of figure that out. So if it reaches that threshold, I keep it. 
And it oftentimes does meet the 24 hour threshold too, which is around 60 to 70,000 impressions, sometimes way more than that. There we go, guys. We need to start deleting tweets. Cody, thanks for the questions. So, Brett, first of all, thank you so much for A, creating something that's so innovative and profitable. It's very inspiring. But B, being so transparent about it. I sent Brett some questions over for this before this. And Brett was just like, you ask me anything. And those are always the best interviews. So, Brett, thank you so much. There will be a recording of this released on a podcast that I'll link below. Brett, anything else you want to share? No, man, I appreciate you setting this up. It was sort of a surprise to do it live here on Twitter, but that was awesome. So I appreciate you having me. Amazing. And thanks to all of you guys for tuning in. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. All right. What do we think about that, guys? A Spaces episode. If you have any feedback about those, drop me a DM on Twitter or also a DM on LinkedIn. Planning on doing a couple more. I love the live aspect and it's great to get questions live from the audience. So if you have any strong thoughts on doing more or less than them, please let me know. Thank you to everybody that tuned into the space and thank you, Brett, for coming on and being so transparent and open with everything that's happening in that company. Of course, thanks to Fame for producing this episode and thanks to you for listening.